So I'm at the playground at my daughter's school, and one of my warrior mommies comes over to me, Georgia. She's one of my favorite moms. And she says, Steph, there's this position opening at my organization. And I'm like, Georgia, tell me more. She's like, there's a digital director position, but Steph, the position only pays 115000 And I take a deep breath, and I think to myself, what Georgia doesn't know about me, what Georgia doesn't know is that my grandmother came to this country from the Dominican Republic in 1961. And what Georgia doesn't know is that for 25 years, my grandmother woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning and didn't come home until 7 p.m. And for 25 years, my grandmother never earned more than $5 an hour. And what Georgia doesn't know is that my mother worked until she was 41 years old and never earned more than 39000 as a receptionist. And what Georgia really doesn't know is that after 10 years of being a digital director on Capitol Hill, I had not earned more than $80,000. And I think further to myself of all of the things that Georgia doesn't know about me. And what Georgia really doesn't know is that by every definition, I am a statistic. I am a brown girl without options when the world sees me. I was born to a single mom at 18 years old who didn't have a high school diploma. When I was five years old, Miss McGurcia in my head start pulled my aunt aside and said, clearly Stephanie has special needs because I didn't speak English. But what Miss McGurcia didn't know was that I didn't speak English out of respect to my grandmother who spent those 25 years working and making $5 an hour. And I think of all of the things that Georgia doesn't know is that I spent my childhood on the Metro North every holiday and every weekend traveling to see my stepfather in prison. And I also think that Georgia doesn't know something actually I didn't know about myself until very recently when I was sitting at a Senate briefing on homeless students that never having a bedroom and not having a bed classified me as a homeless student. And that by every definition of the word, I'm not supposed to be standing here right now. And I am a brown girl without options. And I think back to Georgia, right? And I come back to this moment and I, in my deep breath and I turn around to Georgia and I say, you know what? I think I can make 115,000 work. <laughs> I think I can make it work. And that was the first moment that I found myself to be a brown girl with options. Fast forward a couple of months, Georgia's organization did follow up and they reached out with a position. And my career coach, because when you're a brown girl with options, you get one of those. <laughs> He says to me, he says, Steph, I'm going to introduce you to this headhunter. And this headhunter introduces me to a competing organization to Georgia's organization. And what I find myself at for the first time in my life is a bidding war between two organizations. And these organizations, they come and they interview me. And after three days of meeting with everyone, I get the job offer. And I think back to my conversation with Georgia when the HR rep calls me. And she says, so how much do you want? And I say, a million dollars. <laughs> and the HR and I person just laugh. And after three days, I take time to think about it. I get offered for the first time in my life six figures. And I'm sitting with another warrior mommy of mine. I'm at a conference in California. And I'm thinking about all of the things that I need to evaluate before I accept this offer. I think about the benefits, the flexibility. I'm a mother. What's best for me and my family? And it's the first time that I approach this job search as a brown girl with options. I take the job. I take the six figures. It's been three years. I was given one staff member. And in the past three years, I now have a team of nine women, predominantly women of color. And I've committed myself to ensuring that all of them have options and that I elevate them as well. So then I think there's a date that you all will remember. Um, things are going really well in my career. And it's November 8th, 2016. And it's the night of the election. And I went to bed early because I, like many people, thought that Hillary was going to get elected. So I go to sleep. And it's about 1130 at night. And my daughter, who's nine years old at the time, wakes me up really scared. And she's crying. And she says, Mommy, 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 something's wrong. And I'm like, what is wrong, sweetie? What's wrong? She said, the map is red, mommy. The map is not supposed to be red. And what I felt in that moment was my daughter's very own existence being threatened. I felt the fear that my daughter felt. 
And the next day when I walked into that job that I so proudly took with the salary that I wanted, I walked into that staff and I told them, I can no longer work here. Because in this moment in history, I have to stand on the right side of history. I have to look at my grandchildren in the face and tell them that I stood up against hate, that I stood up just so that they could have value. And that is what I have dedicated myself for the past year. And what my job doesn't know, they might watch this video, <laughs> and most people don't know, is that for the past year and a half, I've dedicated myself to working on some of the biggest movements in this country. So Georgia, my warrior mommy and I, we organized all the fourth grade moms to go to the Women's March on DC, because what else would you do when you're facing an inauguration of Donald Trump? Mm -hmm. And so we're organizing all the moms and we got our daughters ready and we're so excited. And two nights before the march, I get an email. And the subject of the email is, do you want to be a part of history? And res my response is yes. I don't know what I'm signing up for, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm gonna be there. And within 48 hours, I assemble a team of seven women of color. And these women lead the entire digital and social strategy for the Washington DC Women's March. And I am so proud and humbled to have led that team. So my job still doesn't know. I tell my entire staff to take the night off and the day off from work. And we were part of this moment. And what was so important for me to be a part of this moment was lifting up the voices of white women, black women, Asian women, women from all over the country that were standing up and saying, that's enough and we're not gonna accept this. And that was another moment that I saw myself as a brown girl with options. And I remember I said to my staff member, the most dangerous thing is a brown girl with options. So thinking back on my grandmother and my mother and all of the sacrifices that they made so that I could grow up to have the options that I have, I think about my daughter. And I cannot allow my daughter to wait until she is 30 years old to realize that she has options. And I will continue to dedicate myself to this work every single day. Thank you. Woo!